Obesity Explained, Episode 4, Torpor, Circadian Rhythms, and the Aral Hydrocarbon Receptor. Featuring Otis, the 2021 Fat Bear Week Champion. I've been thinking a lot about circadian rhythms. I believe that fattening is a biological process. It's not necessarily caused by uh, eat less, move more. It doesn't necessarily solve obesity. I think we need to think of it in a biological context. I've been thinking about circadian rhythms because I live in upstate New York and I took this photo off of my porch the other day uh, at 1.45 p.m. Um, it wasn't raining or snowing. This is just what it looks like in upstate New York in January. Uh, today looks more or less the same. <laughs> That's just what it is. It makes you ponder your, your life decisions. <laughs> anyway, um... And to, just to, to think about fattening as a biological process, uh, you know, a great way to think about that is hibernating mammals. This is Otis uh, in the summer of 2020, 2021 here on the left. Um, and this is the same bear in the fall of 2021. He was the uh, Fat Bear Week champ. And that's a fun, um, you know, that's a fun program done by the National Parks. Um, and as you can see... It is Otis's biological imperative to become fat before winter. And one of the things that is controlling that is Otis's circadian rhythms. Uh, mammals get fat when the days get short, right? That's, that's how it works. That's not always how it works, but that's typically how it works. Um, and so this is kind of a preview slide. What we're going to talk about is your circadian rhythm absolutely affects your body weight and your whether or not you gain or lose fat. Um, this seems absolutely true. Um, but interestingly, if you've been following these videos, it turns out that the era hydrocarbon receptor actually controls your circadian rhythm or it can control your circadian rhythm in certain circumstances. And it probably is a master regulator of torpor. That's my opinion. That has not been proven, but I, I think the evidence supports it. Um, and the other thing, I have this back arrow because circadian rhythms, your circadian rhythms also control the aryl hydrocarbon receptor. So this is a two-way street. The AHR controls circadian rhythms and the circadian rhythms control the AHR. And you'll see that. Um, and so... And this idea that fattening is a biological process and these circadian rhythms affect obesity in humans, this meta-analysis concluded that cross-sectional studies from around the world show a consistent increased risk of obesity amongst short sleepers in children and adults. And I suspect you've seen those articles in the popular press that uh, people with disrupted sleep, uh, people like on the night shift, are more likely to be obese. Um this is a, the clock gene is a crucial controller of your circadian rhythm. And if you take a group of obese humans and you uh, split them up based on which version of the clock gene they have, there's this variant called 3111 uh, TC. Anyway, um, if you take people who are already obese and if you split them up by which version of this clock gene that they have, people with a less active version of the gene with a with a blunted circadian rhythm are actually more obese than other obese people. <laughs> so it's it's a it's a bit of a funny um, way because in lean people you don't see the difference, but something about if you go down that road to obesity and fat storage, if you have a blunted circadian rhythm, you will become even fatter than someone with a normal circadian rhythm is probably the best way to say that. Um, and another, uh, this is another study. And so they took people and they put them on a weight loss diet. It's a low calorie Mediterranean style weight loss diet. And the interesting thing is that, uh, they, they split them up based on their genetics. And again, it's looking at this clock gene mutation. And what they found is that, uh, People with a normal clock, or two copies of the normal clock gene are these uh, gray circles. And so they continue to lose weight at a more or less linear fashion throughout the 28 weeks of this weight loss study. But people with a blunted circadian rhythm with this uh, bad version of the clock gene, they stalled out on weight loss around week 14 and really don't continue to lose weight past that. And so you can see real differences in... Uh, circadian rhythms and weight in humans. 
Uh, and so one of the things about circadian rhythms is it controls your levels of NAD+. And if you followed my blog and if you followed my videos, you know that I think high NAD plus levels are the key to a healthy me metabolic rate and staying in sort of fat burning mode rather than fat storing mode. Um, the way this happens is through an enzyme called NAMPT. Uh, so there's a bunch of enzymes, the sirtuins, the PARPs, and CD38, and they all use NAD plus to perform their enzymatic activity. And the NAD plus gets converted to nicotinamide when they, when they do this. Um, and so you need this NAMPT to recycle the nicotinamide and come back around to get NAD plus again. And so, and so this is the NAMPT gene, and this is over a 24 hour, or I think in this graph, it's even a 28 hour period. And so what you can see is it is there's this real, um, this kind of wave look to NAMPT over a 24 hour period because it's a circadian gene. So it goes up in the day and it, you know, when you're, when your body temperature, when your um, metabolism, metabol, metabolic rate is high in the middle of the day, the NAMPT is at its peak. And at night, when you go to sleep, it drops. Um, and so this is the same study. And they also looked at NAD plus levels throughout the day. And so you can see it reflects that NAMPT uh, graph, but it's offset by about four hours or maybe eight hours. And so you have this peak of MAMPT maybe in the early morning and you have this peak of NAD plus say in the late afternoon, but, um, you know, but there's a definite circadian rhythm to the amount of NAD plus that you have. And they also looked in the study at mice with a mutant version of the clock gene. And you can see that if, if you don't have that clock gene, if you can't produce, uh, you know, enzymes and genes that are controlled in a circadian fashion, uh, you are going to have very low levels of NAD+. And in fact, um, the mice that lack that clock gene become obese. And so these are mice on two different diets. Um, you've got a, um, a normal low fat mice mouse diet and you've got this high fat diet and and the mice with disrupted circadian rhythm have hyperphagia which means that they overeat uh you know uh the grizzly bear otis also has hyperphagia in the fall his uh your circadian rhythms control your um your satiety regulation um and they eat they eat 24 hours a day instead of you know only eating during the day and anyway they get fatter so these these dark lines um, are, are, these are two my, mice on two different diets. So this line here with the red arrow that says clock mutant low fat. So that's mice with no clock gene on a low fat diet. And they're fatter than these two lines down here are the normal mice. Um, and so the, the clock mutant mice on a low fat diet are even fatter than, uh, this arrow is normal mice on a high fat diet. So normal mice on a high fat diet is typically what we use to study obesity in mice. And even on a low fat diet, the clock mutant mice are, are fatter than those mice. But uh, if you put them on the high fat diet that's designed to fatten up mice, the clock mutant mice get very, very fat indeed. Um, and so this is just looking at this from a different angle. These are Syrian hamsters and a Syrian hamster is a hibernating animal. They store fat for winter and what you can see is they put them in, they put these mice into two different uh, day lengths to see how it affects their, their, um, their genes that control the circadian rhythms, right? Clock and clock's binding partner is B male. So clock and B male together, they bind together and they go into the nucleus to turn on the genes involved in circadian rhythms. And you can see um, the ones with the black squares, those are in a, a short day length. So that's equivalent that's 10 hours of daylight, 14 hours of darkness. That's equivalent to about November 9th in upstate New York, where I live. The, the black triangles, those are in a 14 hour day and a 10 hours of darkness. And that's equivalent to May 1st in upstate New York. And what you can see is uh, these guys have a real drop in their clock gene production in the middle of the night that are in the short day, right? That are in living in November who think that it's November 9th because we're, you know, we're artificially manipulating the light. Um, and so this is a separate study, but in this study, they did the same thing. They, they either made the day length, you know, November or May and they fed them. So these circles are a high fat diet. That's of course designed to fatten them up. 
Um, and no matter both at both day lengths, the mice given the high fat diet gained weight, but the ones in the short day gained significantly more weight than the ones in the long day. And in this case, they didn't eat any more. So in a short day length, the mice were much more likely to store the calories they consume as fat rather than to burn the calories. Um, and this is interesting. So when, when hibernating animals go into hibernation, uh, they're not actually sleeping. They are in torpor and, and torpor means they don't have a circadian rhythm anymore, right? The days become meaningless to them. And so you can see these um, these hamsters in the summer have this very distinct. So melatonin is a gene that is that's very well known. I'm sure you've heard of it. It's controlled by your circadian rhythm. You produce it at night and not in the day. And so this is uh, these these hamsters in the summer, and you can see you have this distinct. Uh, this is again a, a 24 hour day. So so each of these blocks is four hours. So you can see this distinct. It's about an 11 hour peak of melatonin that's produced in the night, and then the 12 hours of day, it's very low. But when they're hibernating, there's no melatonin peak at all. Um, the, the circadian rhythm is absolutely blocked during hibernation. Now, this is interesting because um, this is another gene. This is another study. This is journal Nature. And what they showed is that this thing called tetrachlorodibenzopedioxin, if you've been following along, you might guess that's actually TCDD. And what TCDD does, TCDD does, is it activates the aryl hydrocarbon receptor. And the aryl hydrocarbon receptor responds by uh, flattening the circadian rhythms in these mice. Um, it says that TCDD abolishes circadian regulation of hepatic metabolic activity in mice. And they looked at 25 different circadian genes. And this is absolutely true. Uh, TCDD absolutely shuts down circadian rhythms. And that means that the aryl hydrocarbon receptor is in charge of your circadian rhythms. And so, uh, and this is just those, those two slides just side by side as comparison. These are the hibernating squirrels. You can see the nice peak in hibernation. It's flat. And this is uh, a circadian gene in a mouse. You can see the nice 12 hour peak. And if you give them TCDD, it's flat. So the winter pattern looks like the activated era hydrocarbon receptor pattern, right? Um, and so how does that happen? Well, it turns out that uh, the AHR is very closely related to the clock gene. They're, they're homologs. They're, they're almost the same protein. They're like, uh, they're like twins or something. And so what happens is, uh, when the era hydrocarbon receptor is activated, it can actually displace clock. So, so this little diagram, what they are is clock and BMOL have come together. They're transcription factors. They turn on other genes. And when they meet up, and, and so this is supposed to represent DNA, they go to the DNA and they find their specific spots on the DNA of the genes that they control, and they turn those genes on. Um, but the AHR is, like I say, it's an exact analog of clock. So it can just swap out for clock. And that's what it does when it's activated. And so this is a, a pictorial view of how that works. You know, AHR basically is coming off the top ropes to destroy clock and to destroy your circadian rhythms. And ultimately that is going to leave you with low NAD plus levels, right? Because NAD plus, let's remember, is controlled by the transcription factor clock. And so what this diet, so just to further show what's going on in this diagram, um, this top level, they looked at aryl hydrocarbon receptor knockout mice. So they don't have an aryl hydrocarbon receptor gene at all. And they have these big bouncy circadian rhythm patterns. And then you have a normal mouse. And so they have the gene, the aryl hydrocarbon receptor, but it's not super active. And you just have normal circadian rhythms in these mice. Um, but then if you activate the era hydrocarbon receptor in this experiment, of course, they did it by using something like TCDD, which activates the AHR. Boom. Era hydrocarbon receptor comes in, knocks out clock. And now once the era hydrocarbon receptor binds here instead of clock, these genes don't get produced. And you see these very flat, um, you see this very flat circadian pattern. And so then when you look at, um, 
the hibernating animals, as they go through their cycle of torpor, it becomes very interesting. This is kinurinine. Kinurinine is a known activator of the era hydrocarbon receptor. And these are different stages of torpor. And the further into torpor and into hibernation the animals get, the more of this kinurinine they produce, which is activating the era hydrocarbon receptor. And what I find very interesting is that, so this is the amount of of kinurinine in the summer over here. So this would be like in July, right? When they're active, that's, that's an active, um, what are we in an Arctic ground squirrel? Um, but in the fall, this first stage is ENT. That means entrance to torpor, this light blue. And so those animals have probably a 50% elevated level of kinurinine compared to normal squirrels. And so they're going to have a more active era hydrocarbon receptor. And in this first box, like I say, this is the end of the fattening season. And so, um, yeah, and so squirrels in the fattening season have maybe 50% more AHR. As they get deeper into hibernation, each of these colored blocks is basically another two-week cycle of, of, of hibernation. And so, like I say, they're not sleeping in hibernation. What happens is they go into this torpor for two weeks, their body temperature is very low, and then every couple of weeks they have to warm their body temperature up actually so that they can sleep. So they actually kick on their metabolic rate, they get warm and then they sleep for a day and then they go back into torpor. Um, and so obviously as the season goes on, the kinurinine is, kinurinine is going higher and higher. It's activating the era hydrocarbon receptor because they want to absolutely turn off the circadian rhythms while they hibernate, keep that NAD plus levels low, keep the metabolic rate slow as they hibernate and then when they come out of hibernation you see this rapid drop in kinurinine levels and therefore this rapid drop in activated ahr and they come you know and by the time they get to summer they're at their lowest uh, amount of ahr activation of the whole year um and i just this is just a recap of this graph uh you just see again the difference this is the summer low kinurinine low ahr this big peak of melatonin and this is the winter high this is very high kinurinine presumably very high ahr activity and uh the ahr has blocked clock and the circadian rhythm is gone and nad plus levels are low and and this graph is just to point out so this is um from a paper uh, that I believe I showed in episode two. And you can see that uh, the obese humans have significantly more uh, plasma kinurinine. And it's about 50% more, just like in the hibernating animals between summer and fall. So we can say that obese humans look like fattening hibernators um, in the run-up to hibernation from the perspective of kinurinine and era hydrocarbon receptor activation levels. And so this is this slide is just kind of a, a thought question. Um, you know, does sleep loss cause obesity? And of course it does. And you see that in the case of shift workers being more likely to be obese. But the other option is that an activated era hydrocarbon receptor can cause sleep loss um, and obesity. And so there are other ways to activate the aryl hydrocarbon receptor, such as if you get poisoned by dioxins, which are in our environment, they're in beef, they're in drinking water, or you can ingest too much linoleic acid and it oxidizes in your LDL and you have oxidized LDL. Oxidized LDL also activates the aryl hydrocarbon receptor. And so there's a lot of ways to get an activated aryl hydrocarbon receptor and the activated AHR can cause insomnia and sleep loss uh, in the same way that sleep loss can activate the AHR ultimately. And uh, we know that uh, disrupted circadian rhythm does activate the AHR. This is an experiment where they, they take mice and they put them in like 24 hours of daylight and they mess with them and they play loud noises and do all these things to disrupt their circadian rhythm. And you can see that a disrupted circadian rhythm screws up their Kinurinine levels, and kinurinine is made from tryptophan. And so that's why they're talking about dysregulating tryptophan metabolism. And so um, what you see here is the, the blue and red mice have this nice, you know, this nice 24-hour cycle, right? And and so the, the blue and light red, uh, or the light blue and red mice, 
they have normal sleep. Um, this these purple mice up here have disrupted circadian rhythms just by you know leaving the lights on and playing loud noises, etc. And so you can see how much more canyurnine that they have at all times of day um, than normal mice. So disrupted sleep activates can urine or rise, rises <laughs> raises can urinine and that uh will activate the ahr and you see if if you give these mice poo or tea however um it really reduces the amount of can urinine over, produced over a 24-hour cycle it doesn't go all the way back to non-circadian disrupted mice but these are mice with circadian disruption and poor tea, and it and it does go a long way towards fixing um, the tryptophan metabolism and lowering kinurinine levels. Um, this is another gene with poor tea and this circadian rhythm. Um, this is melatonin, and so you see again with the the red and light blue mice, you see this nice twenty four hour pattern. With the purple, these are the dysregulated mice. It's almost opposite. Like um, the normal mice, they have this drop in melatonin during the day. Uh, the disrupted mice have this rise in melatonin during the day, which is obviously the opposite of what's supposed to happen. Um, and the poor T again comes in and makes things look a lot more like normal mice. They're still not perfect with the disrupted sleep. Uh, this is the clock gene itself. So you can see the clock gene, uh, you see the nice normal curve in the red and light blue. Um, the purple line, the disrupted mice, have an almost flat clock gene. It almost looks like melatonin in the winter. And the poor T, you know, puts that puts that circadian rhythm back to kind of, to pretty normal, actually, in, in the case of the clock gene. Um, and this is BML, clock's binding partner, and it's just kind of the same thing. In this one, you can see that the... Um, the totally disrupted mice in the purple are doing the exact opposite thing of what they're supposed to be doing, right? The wave is completely upside down. Uh, and again, giving them the poor T, this light green line there, they're doing they're doing a heck of a lot better than the other circadian disrupted mice, right? If you give them, if you disrupt their circadian rhythms and give them poor T, they do a lot better than if you uh, just disrupt their circadian rhythm without anything. Um, I tend to believe that uh, that tea brownin from poor tea is probably a pretty strong arahydrocarbon receptor inhibitor. Um, we saw that in ep episode or episode two, where the the poor tea and the tea brownin has the opposite effects from TCDD on bile acid excretion. So if you activate the AHR, bile acid excretion drops. If you give things poo or tea, bile acid excretion increases. You know, in this episode, as we just saw, um, uh, you know, disrupting uh, circadian rhythms increases uh, kinurinine and therefore AHR activation, and it dysregulates a lot of their circadian genes. And the poo or tea uh, goes a long way towards restoring some of those circadian rhythms. Um, and there's reason to believe there's a lot of evidence that poor tea may be a direct AHR inhibitor. Uh, I don't think anyone's studied that directly, but what happens is you, you start with green tea and you have these catechins, which is a type of, uh, flavonoid. And those look a lot like, um, other things that are known to block the hydrocarbon receptor, uh, uh, other flavones that I talked about. I think in episode three, um, and when you oxidize that tea to black tea, these catechins become tea of flavins. And if you oxidize and ferment the tea into poor tea, they get even more oxidized and they become tea brownin. Um, and you can see the color changes and the, the tea brownins are indeed what give the poor tea that, that dark color. It's a dark colored pigment. Um, and this is a study using those those tea of flavins from the black tea. So those are the oxidized catechins that occur naturally in the green tea. And this graph is actually showing the amount that it blocks the era hydrocarbon receptor. And so uh, the green tea does not block the AHR. The oolong tea does a little bit. The black tea of the tea of flavins is pretty effective at blocking the AHR. And my guess is that if someone studied it, you would show that those tea brownins are very effective at blocking the AHR, and that's why I carry a uh, tea brown and extract. Uh, you can get it at fireinabottle.net uh, slash shop. 
Um, and I'm actually doing a New Year's sale. Uh, it was $29.99. Now it's $24.99. And each of those capsules is essentially the equivalent of three cups of poo or tea. So uh, there's 60 capsules in a bottle. So that's 180 cups of tea, which comes out to about 14 cents per cup of tea, which I think is not bad. Um, you can get that at fireinabottle.net slash shop. I recommend taking one of those capsules at every meal, uh, probably one in the morning. And for me, I, I'm a coffee drinker. I don't drink a lot of tea, so uh, it's easy for me to take the capsules. But of course, if you want to drink uh, all that tea, you can do that as well. Um, and I want to bring up the idea of light therapy. Um, this is a study where they uh, people woke up and they they were given a bright light and they kind of stare into that light for 20 or 20 minutes or half an hour in the morning to try to um, normalize your circadian rhythms if you live in a place where it's dark all the time like I do. <laughs> and so that actually uh, had some effects. Um, these weight loss trials with bright light therapy, um, the results are not astonishing, but, but sometimes they do show some effect on weight loss. Uh, you can see here, like if you look at fat mass, um, and this is over a period of weeks. So, so people who use the light therapy, uh, in a three week period went from 100% of their initial fat mass down to about 98.4% of their fat mass after three weeks of light therapy. So that's interesting. I'm personally interested in sort of not only bright light therapy, but also extending the day length, uh, using light therapy. So I've got one of those big ring lights that you use for making videos, right? Cause I make videos. <laughs> and so I've just started uh, turning that on in the mo first thing in the morning when I wake up. So maybe 7 30 AM, I turn that thing on bright and I stare at it for a couple minutes and, and I leave it on until 7 30 or 8 PM to try to tell my body that like, Oh no, I'm not living in upstate New York in November. I'm living in, you know, whatever, I don't know the tropics somewhere. Right. Because, because your body is, is, uh, is, taking into account the day length when it's deciding, oh, are we going to burn calories a day? We're going to store calories today. Um, and I wrote this works in chickens because, you know, it's well known. Uh, if you read any backyard chicken raising book, it will tell you that chickens stop laying eggs in the winter. And one of the things you could do is you can artificially, you could just put light bulbs in their, in their pen. And, you know, if they have a 16 hour day, they're going to lay a lot more eggs than if they have a, the nine hour day that I'm living in here in upstate New York in January. Um, and so, yeah, so let's think about all this. Um, so mammals know one of the ways that mammals know that winter is coming is that the day lengths are short, right? And that is a signal to the animal to uh, store fat, right? Rather than burn it. And one of the ways that it does this, as you saw in that one graph is by reducing the amount of clock gene that it's producing, reducing the amount of those circadian genes that are produced during a short day length. Um, that clock gene goes down, NAD plus levels go down. And yes, indeed, um, mice with a clock mutation get fat. You know, if you don't have a proper circadian rhythm, you're going to put on a lot more fat. Um, and of course, another way to disrupt your circadian rhythm other than short day lengths is by activating the aryl hydrocarbon receptor. So you don't want to do things that activate the aryl hydrocarbon receptor, which include being poisoned by dioxins, um, but which also include uh, perhaps eating too much, uh, too much linoleic acid, too much omega-6 fats um, that get incorporated into, um, into your LDL and oxidizing. And I'm going to have many episodes about um, the relationship between linoleic acid consumption and oleic acid consumption and how that affects oxidized LDL and the aryl hydrocarbon receptor. Uh, so lots more coming up this year. Um, and again, I just want to point out how much, when you look at kinurinine levels and AHR activation, how much obese humans look like uh, fattening hibernators as as hibernation season approaches, right? They both have elevated kinurinine, um, and that means an elevated a an activated AHR, I should say. Um, the Tia Brownin from Pu'er T uh, really helps to restore kinurinine levels to their their proper level, and really helps to restore your circadian rhythms. Um, and you know, I think that is. It's probably as good as anything I've seen. I suspect that 
uh, poor T does this by directly blocking um, the AHR. Uh, and also something to think about is maybe doing some light therapy. Um, you could try bright lights in the morning. You might want to try leaving the bright lights on all day like I've been doing or for 12 hours anyway. And so uh, check back in. I got a whole series of videos this year. I think they're going to be really good. Uh, the next one is going to be about AHR and the gut microbiome. Here's a little preview. In the same way that the ERA hydrocarbon receptor has this two-way control over the circadian rhythms, like if you disrupt their circadian rhythms, it increases AHR, but also if you increase the AHR, it disrupts your circadian rhythms. Um, AHR and the gut microbiome are the exact same way. So one of the ways to really decrease your gut microbiome diversity is to activate the aryl hydrocarbon receptor. So check back in.